Having looked at all the orchestral instruments individually, having explained orchestral balance, Kirchlein devotes the second volume of the Traité d'Orchestration for writing for each orchestral family alone, and then to their combinations. The focus here is on the various possible textures for each family. As in the first volume, there are hundreds of repertoire examples illustrating every point and detailed discussions of why the composers made the choices they did. Kirchner starts with the strings. He points out that writing well for string quartet is the foundation for learning to compose for string orchestra. So this chapter starts out with detailed discussions of many examples from string quartets, ranging from Haydn to Debussy and other French composers of his time. The reason that the string quartet is the best starting point is that, unlike, say, writing for woodwinds, they are a blended group of singing instruments with enormous technical agility and flexibility. This has important implications for the background layers of tone. On the piano, often the accompaniment to the main line or lines is idiomatic figuration, but it's all played by the same person. In the strings, there are individual people actually playing these parts, so the details of the accompaniment can be much more defined. In fact, as Richard Strauss mentions in the preface to his revision of Berlioz's orchestration treatise, uninteresting inner parts are one of the most common causes of mediocre orchestration. This isn't to say that the background lines should necessarily be as active as the main line, rather that paying attention to making them richer has a significant effect on the overall result. Krishna looks at various chord spacings and different dynamics. He also mentions situations where the main line is elsewhere than the first violin. This is an important point that one can learn from string quartet orchestration. Don't always give the main line to the same instrument. Quartet is an egalitarian ensemble where everyone deserves some time in the sun. This is an application of counterpoint, not in the sense of imitation or fugue, rather simply as a requirement to look at each line individually to make it as interesting as possible. The first examples are in four parts, since that's the texture where there's an ideal balance between the interest of the main line and the secondary ones, as in standard chorale writing. He also discusses four-part divisi textures. Then he moves on to three-part textures in the strings. This often means that one of the lines is doubled, for example, violin one and two playing in octaves. Kirschla discusses various ways to lay out two-part textures in the strings, followed by denser textures in five or six parts, and one-part textures. Since there are so many ways to distribute the lines here, there are, as usual, many examples. His discussion goes well beyond the standard doublings. He also covers unusual situations, for example, where the double basses are two octaves from the cello rather than the normal single octave doubling, or where some of the strings are playing harmonics. There's also a discussion of massive divisi textures. This kind of variety of texture is basic to good orchestration. Because most musicians start with four-part harmony for choir, that doesn't mean that writing for the orchestra should always be in four parts. Quite the contrary, in fact, since there isn't much point in having a large ensemble if the texture is always the same. Then Kirschla goes into pizzicato, muted strings, harmonics, and other less common effects. Finally, he discusses the use of solo strings within the string orchestra. As usual, he's aiming at an encyclopedic presentation of what can be done with the strings. The goal here is not just a list of all the possibilities, to provide examples of the musical character they can produce. Even if you don't read French, it can be useful to look at the examples. Having gone through the strings, next Kirschland turns to the human voice. Again, a student who studied classical harmony will be accustomed to four voice homophonic and polyphonic textures, but there are so many other possible ways to use voices in groups. Kirschla also wrote excellent counterpoint and harmony textbooks. One of the first things he discusses here is situations where the rules that the students have learned in those areas don't apply. This is typical of his teaching. Rules aren't God-given, but simply ways to avoid common problems. But when you understand the problems behind them, you also know how and when you can break the rules. After this introduction to vocal textures, you will learn to discuss duos like tenor and soprano or soprano and baritone. This brings up the question of the relationship between men's and women's voices. How can they be combined and contrasted? So far, all the vocal examples have been of soloists. Now Kirschlem moves on to choral writing. Here, the examples go back as far as the 13th century. They again include many kinds of vocal textures, ranging from very dense counterpoint to parallel chords, as well as which dynamics are appropriate for the various registers and dispositions. This is important since, unlike strings, voices cannot easily do all dynamics on all registers. So, for example, having the tenors above the altos will usually make them more prominent since they're in our high register and the altos are rather low. There's a section about writing for unaccompanied choir, a cappella, and also a discussion of various vowel sounds as well as pronunciation, and a situation where the intonation is very difficult, including an example from Schoenberg. The next part of the book is about the percussion. Kirschner points out that the percussion is different from the other orchestral families 
that includes many different kinds of instruments. It's not a blended group in the sense, say, that the strings are. One can combine two or three percussion instruments in a blended way, for example, marimba and xylophone, but these instruments have nothing in common with, say, the crash cymbals. After the percussion, there's a detailed discussion of brass instruments. Kirschla discusses the way, unlike percussion, brass instruments generally blend well into one family. Like the strings, they can be used in various spacings without weakening the blend of the sounds, as long as extreme gaps are avoided. Personally, I find very widely spaced brass chords a bit odd, perhaps because the extreme thickness of the brass timber contrasts too much with the empty spaces. The brass section of the book also includes specific examples and explanations about the horns. Krishna points out that the horns can be used with the woodwind family, although their role is not the same as in the brass section as a whole. Books that have various intervals sound in the horns, including the way older composers could only use notes in the harmonic series, like octaves and fifths. Of course, today the horns are fully chromatic, but this is still relevant. If you want the most transparent sound in the horns, they're best arranged in open intervals. Next, he discusses trumpets and cornets, used separately or in combination, and then trombones. For the latter, when they're used harmonically, they should be arranged to sound complete in themselves, since they easily stand out from the other families. For example, avoid a succession of empty parallel force in the trombones if you want a rich harmonic sound. Of course, the trumpets can complete the trombones in the higher register, but if the trumpets are too low, the higher notes in the trombone will stand out too much. Then follows a section about trombones in tuba. Since so the tuba has a fatter sound than the trombones, it doesn't blend perfectly with them. Some composers, notably Wagner, I should require a family of tubas in various registers for perfect blends. Then we look at how to combine the horns and the heavy brass together. In this situation, normally the horns are alto and tenor instruments, ideal for enriching the middle register. The examples in the brass chapter range from doubling of a single line to full four-part writing, and as usual, Kirschner shows how the composer's choices are appropriate to the musical character. The next chapter is about the woodwinds, and it's very long. This is because the woodwinds, unlike the strings and the brass, don't blend by default. So, when putting together woodwind textures, it's important to know which instrument will stand out, in which register, and at which dynamic. Once again, Kirschlein's presentation is encyclopedic, with dozens of examples of the many possible combinations, ranging from combinations of two different timbres, like flute and clarinet, to three, four, and more timbres. Here's an example of one page where he discusses combining flute, oboe, and clarinet. In the bottom half of this page, there are examples of single chords with the three instruments in various registers. There are examples of them stacked in layers, overlapping, interlocking, or doubled at the unison. It's notable that there's no chord here with the oboes below the flutes in the low register, since the oboe would dominate the sonority. In these chords, the goal is overall blend, despite their diverse characters. Only the Wagner example is from the repertoire, although dispositions like these are very common in standard orchestration. Kirschla includes combinations of woodwinds and horns, since horns blend better with woodwinds than the heavy brass do. For example, he mentions that the combination of horn with flute at the unison is pretty useless, since the flute is very weak in the register it shares with the horns. In a soft dynamic, however, if the horn is muted or stopped, this combination can occasionally be useful. There are even examples of woodwinds combined with saxophones. The last chapter in this volume is about combinations of orchestral families. Woodwinds and brass, horns and strings, winds and strings, and all three families together. There are sections about melodies doubled between families, as well as an example of chords using various combinations. For example, in a chord with woodwinds and horns, he discusses the difference between using the horn as the low bass note and using a bassoon instead. The bassoon is a bit stronger in the low register. Kirschner's generosity is everywhere in evidence here. He wants to cover every possibility to help the student make better musical decisions in their own work.